Hello, and welcome to this Safety Leadership Conference presentation, Culture and Compliance, How a Stronger Safety Culture Can Increase Compliance. We encourage you to interact with today's speaker and each other in the Q&A chat, which you'll see to your right. Today's presenter is Lance Murray. Lance is the safety manager of Mark Young Construction, which last year, I should point out, was named one of America's safest companies. Lance's full bio can be found by clicking on the speaker profile below. With that, I'm going to now turn it over to Lance Murray. Lance, take it away. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. I appreciate it. So the title of my presentation today, Organizational Safety Culture Communications uh, and How a Safety Culture Can Lead to Better Compliance. Um, so I'm going to go through my set of slides today. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, whatever, um, let's try and, and present those towards the end of the meeting. I will be available after the conclusion of the slide presentation for any questions you might have. Um, so let's go ahead and get going. So for any of the uh, sessions that you've already attended today or will be attending yesterday, today, tomorrow, whatever, um, the whole idea is to grab some nuggets out of what you're getting from some of the presentations. So if you're a scrat, um, the scroll from my stage, um, grab an acorn, um, take it and run with it, take it back to your company, implement things as you see fit, things that work within your organization, within your cultural uh, organization, uh, within the safety culture of your group, whatever. So. Hopefully you find a few things that you can use in this presentation. Some of the things I wanted to uh, bring up, mainly uh, culture, and you'll hear me talk a lot about culture today, both safety culture and organizational safety culture. Uh, perceptions of risk. I think everybody has a unique perception of what risk is. Relationships and how it's really hard to get anything done uh, if you don't have a good relationship with the people that you're working with, communications, and that's communications with line level employees, clear up to the C-suite or uh, your um, president, vice presidents, people up there. Communications, how we communicate with different people in our organization, performance indicators, both leading and lagging indicators, and then safety. For me, safety is integrated. It has to be practical and it has to be humanistic and relatable. I'm gonna be talking about all these points coming up here. So let's start with, what does a strong safety culture look like? Um, number one, safety is a business priority. I'm not a big believer in that safety is the number one business priority. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a couple slides, but this whole notion of safety first and safety is our number one priority, safety above anything and everything else in the organization, I think it's overused at times. Um, and I'll talk some more a little bit about that. Risk perceptions are consistent across the organization. So one person's risk perception should not be different from another person in another department or another project or anywhere else in the organization, our risk perceptions need to be consistent throughout the organization. Our perceptions of safety policies need to be consistent throughout the organization. If our policy says we have a fall, a, a fall tie off point at six feet, then we should be tying off at six feet. Competency. So our employees need to be trained uh, in order to be competent and and efficient at what they do. That's line level employees all the way up to uh, the president of the organization. Everybody has to have some level of training within the organization that makes us competent and safe in our jobs. Employer employee communications. In a strong safety culture, employees have open communication with every level of people in that organization, whether that's the president, the vice president, your upper management, your middle management, your supervisors, your foreman, superintendents, whoever that may be, that communication line should be open across the organization. I'll get a little more into that in a few minutes. Employees are involved in the safety of the organization. 
whether you operate out of safety committees or you don't, um, whether you have incentive programs or whatever it is that you use to involve employees. Employees are actively involved for the safety, not just the program, but within the safety culture of the organization. And then last, individual ownership. Um, basically, nobody should more invested in somebody's safety than that person themselves. As employers, we can provide policies and procedures and, and uh, SOPs. Uh, we can provide uh, personal protective equipment. We can provide all these things in the organization, but ultimately it's up to that employee to wear those things, to utilize the training that they've received um, and be involved with their own safety on the job not depending on that safety person to look out for them, but ultimately looking out for safety for themselves. Um, I don't know if you've seen, um, there's, if you look on, on YouTube, um, Mike Rowe from uh, Dirtiest Jobs, I don't know if you know Mike Rowe or not, or ever seen Dirtiest Jobs or, or the Crab Fisherman Dangerous Jobs or whatever. Um, but if you do a YouTube search or a Google search, uh, Mike Rowe, Safety Third, he gets into the individual ownership of safety. And no matter how many signs and posters and policies we have in place, ultimately safety is on the employee. So to me, that's kind of what a strong safety culture looks like. And the culture is gonna drive a lot of the compliance components that you need or, or require within your organization. Culture to me is this is just the way we do things within our organization. Um, we wouldn't consider getting up on a, on a seven foot cooler case without some type of fall protection. So right or wrong, this is kind of what a definition of, of culture is. Right or wrong in the workplace, what is accepted? What are the things that, that are accepted by your employees, by your middle managers, supervisors, um, your superintendents? maybe your, your vice president, president, these are the things that happen on the job site. They're just accepted, they're a normal way of life. Um, I can tell you from experience, a night shift versus a day shift when there's, when there's more people in the, in the facility, night shift may look a little different than what we are used to on the day shift. So the use of PPE, hard hats, safety, safety vests, gloves, and things like that. What is required? those policies and procedures that we have in place. They're your own company or organization, safety policies and procedures that are put in, that are put in place, excuse me, put in place for the safety of the organization and the people within the organization. They're your standard operating procedures. It may be owner requirements. I work for a construction company. We do a lot of work for um, some very large retail organizations across the country. Um, owners of those facilities have certain requirements and certain safety requirements that we are required to comply with. And then what are the OSHA requirements on that job, on the project, within your retail facilities, within your manufacturing facilities? Is it a 1910 regulation or is it a 1926 regulation? Um, maybe it's shipbuilding, maybe it's, it's another form of, of OSHA requirement, but what is required in the workplace? The next one, what is practice? Those are the things that we do to prevent injuries. It's the training that we've received and the implement, implementation of those trainings. Um, it's the use of personal protective equipment. It's the, it's the things that we try and, and do better at. It's, it's our key performance indicators, things like that. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, what is the reality at your work site. So for me, it's a project site. For you, maybe it's a retail site or it's a manufacturing site. But the reality is what really happens aside from what is accepted, required in practice, the reality is what defines your safety culture. Safety culture in a nutshell is a set of shared principles within a given environment exhibited by behaviors believed to be the acceptable norm in that facility. So let me ask you a rhetorical question because of the, the safety training platform that we have today. What do you think most 
employees or even especially new employees, what do they want when they come to work for your facility or, or your, your business? What do you think it is that they want? And when I ask this question to our, our own guys, you know, they, they say employees want to get a paycheck and that's largely true. But ultimately, I think what new employees want more than anything is they want to fit in. And when I'm doing safety orientation for a new employee, I tell them, I go, you're going to get this brand new shiny white hard hat and this brand new shiny orange or, or lime green vest with the high visibility tape on it. And you're going to come out in your long pants and your boots and you're going to get out of your car when you come to work and you're going to put this stuff on and you're thinking, I'm going to look like the biggest safety geek in the world. <laughs> But the reality is when they get out on that job site and they look around and they go, whoa, everybody else is wearing the same thing. All of a sudden they fit in, they feel welcome. They feel like they're part of the crew. They're part of the group. They're part of that working group that, that they want to feel a part of. If we go back to that fourth bullet point in right or wrong, what is the reality? If I tell our guys in that safety orientation, that you're gonna walk out there and you're gonna immediately feel the normal and they walk out there and nobody else is wearing this stuff. Yeah, they're gonna feel like a big safety geek and what's the first thing they're gonna do? They're gonna take it off, throw it back in their car and they're gonna walk out there and, and uh, meet up with whoever it is they're supposed to meet up with before they go to work. Now, hopefully whoever it is they meet up with tells them to go back to their car and get their hard hat and vest. That's what should happen. What should happen is they get out of their car and they look around and see everybody else is wearing the same equipment. But that's our culture. People want to fit in with the culture of the organization. And hopefully as we're establishing those safety cultures, we're creating a strong safety culture where that is the normal. This is the way we do our business. Cultures, everybody has one. We have an organizational culture. We have a safety culture. Everybody has a safety culture. Joe's Auto Shop down on the corner has a safety culture. It may be great, it may be bad, it may be somewhere in the middle, or you know that may, that may be a sliding scale where you're at in that safety culture. But I will tell you, as you are creating your safety culture, as you're strengthening your safety culture, as you're improving your safety culture, you are effectively having a great effect on that organizational culture that you're working with or working for. So as you create a safety culture, you are changing the culture of the organization. Okay, the two come together, they're beginning to integrate. As that safety culture gets greater and greater and you are integrating safety into all aspects of the project or whatever goes on in your organization, as safety is integrated into those things, you're effectively changing that organizational culture. Here's one more definition and I've, and I've modified it a little bit. And that is an organization's values and behaviors modeled by its leaders and internalized by its members, which serve to make safe performance of work. I'm gonna cross out the overriding priority and we'll talk about that again in a few minutes. But making safe performance of work integrated into everything that we do to protect the public, workers, and the environment. That's my ideal definition of what a strong safety culture is. So pictures here, lower left-hand side, weak safety culture, middle is a strong safety culture. On the right, I know as soon as I walk out onto a project and I see housekeeping like this, we've got an issue. <laughs> so ultimately, this is my defini definition of what a culture looks like. Safety first, I think you guys have all seen this term. You've heard it at one point or another. Maybe you've walked into a facility and you've seen a big banner up on the wall that says safety is our number one priority. Uh, nothing is more important than safety. I wanna push back on that a little bit. And I wanna question that, that terminology and say, is safety really first? Because if I say safety is first, I'm not putting myself in direct competition 
like I said, I work on a construction site. So I'm putting myself in direct competition with schedule and budget, um, with quality, and every other component that goes into that project, I'm now in competition for first place. I don't wanna say safety is 31st, I don't wanna say it's 21st or 11th, or I don't think safety needs a placeholder. Um, safety just, it should be integrated into everything that we do. And this doesn't come naturally, but it comes over years of developing that safety culture within the organization to where safety is, is not necessarily first, it's just integrated into everything that we do. Um, by putting safety first, um, I'm in direct competition with everything else for that project. And if I take it down and boil safety now, safety first, ultimately what I'm basically saying is I should just keep everybody home, let them stay home so that they're, they're not, a, they're not subject to any risk on the project. Or maybe I just bring everybody into the office every day and we'll just do safety training all the time. Ultimately, I, I work for a general contractor. We build buildings, we remodel buildings. That's what we do. That's what keeps the front doors open. So if I'm not integrating safety into the culture of the organization, along with the safety culture, I'm ultimately saying it's more important that we take care of safety training and safety of our, of our employees than it is to building that building. So I don't think that's right either. So this whole safety first notion, I just wanna push back on a little bit. What is safety? So safety is integrated. It needs to be integrated into all aspects of the project, all aspects of your manufacturing line, all aspects of your retail establishment or what type of facility that you work in. Safety has to be practical. I work for a general contractor, we build buildings. That's what we do. So if I come up with safety policies and procedures that aren't practical to the ultimate goal of building buildings, it's never gonna work. I'm pushing a square peg into a round hole. I can't put people into a big giant gerbil ball or plastic ball and let them roll around the job site where there's no sharp edges or no hazardous atmospheres it's not conducive to getting the job done. So it ha safety has to be practical. And lastly, safety has to be humanistic. It has to be relatable. If I go out on the job site and I go up to a concrete finisher and I go, hey, Bill, our dart rate is 1.1. Woo woo! And I'm all excited and Bill's gonna look at me and he's gonna go, Lance, I don't know what 1.1 1, 1 is, but if you're happy, I'm happy, good for you. <laughs> it's not 1.1, talking, talking data and statistics to a field guy doesn't make a lot of sense. But if I go up to Bill and I say, hey Bill, the other day I was walking around the corner of the building over there where the scaffold is and a mason accidentally kicked a block off and it missed my shoulder by this much. Bill's gonna remember that. And the next time he walks around the corner of that building where the scaffold is, Bill's gonna take a wider berth, or maybe Bill will take the initiative, or hopefully I did, but maybe, some, maybe Bill will take the initiative to put some barricades up around there to keep people back away from the scaffold. Safety has to be relatable. My project managers, my, my um, vice presidents, our president especially is very keen and aware of what rate numbers are. They're very aware of what 1.1 means. Because ultimately, 1.1 means more work. Integrating safety into all aspects of the project. Bids and planning phases. So whether you're a construction company or manufacturing or retail, think about what it is that you do and all the things that go into doing what you do. From a secretary at the desk to your president to, in our case, we've got um, we've got uh, payroll and AP and we've got estimating, um, we've got superintendents and the field work. So everything that goes into that project. So these subcontractors here that I've listed on the right hand side of your screen, 
tent power, concrete, steel erection, masonry, lighting, refrigeration, painting, glass, landscaping. All these subcontractors, they may have one or two people on a project. They may have 10 or 15 people on a project. But think about how many people I might have on a project, on a large scale project. I may have 100 people on that project. Let me veer away from that comment just for a second here and ask you another rhetorical question. Think about how many decisions you make in a day. Let me ask you a question. How many decisions do you think you make in a day? When we were kids, we were in elementary school, junior high, high school, maybe probably before college. But when, when we were that age, we had people may help make decisions for us. We had parents, we had teachers, we had you know, different people in our lives that were making decisions for us because we didn't have the life experience to really make good experience. That's kind of what we do as parents when we're raising our kids. We're helping them make decisions for the future. We're, we're putting them in certain situations so that they learn from those situations. So when we were kids, we were young. We are making maybe 2,000 decisions a day, and that seems, sounds like a lot. But wait till you hear how many decisions we make in a day as adults. Studies have shown we make about 35,000 decisions a day. <laughs> that sounds crazy, I know, but think about it for a minute. And every, let me also state that every decision you make has an element of risk, and it has an element of safety involved in it. Okay, think about that. This morning, before you were barely coherent, you were asleep in bed, your alarm clock went off. You made three decisions before you were barely conscious. Do I reach over and turn the alarm clock off and go back to sleep? Do I hit the snooze alarm and sleep for another 10 minutes? Or do I get up out of bed and uh, get ready for work? Three decisions real quick before you were even out of bed. A risk associated with each of those. I turn the alarm clock off. I sleep through my alarm. I don't show up at work. Especially if you're a new employee, do you still have a job when you get to work? Um, maybe you're late again. Um, if I hit that snooze alarm, am I going to wake up? You know, the, like I said, there's decisions in everything that we do. Some of those decisions are automatic. Some decisions we make without even giving it a second thought. I walk up to an edge of a road. I look left, I look right, I make sure it's safe to cross before I get there. But as a four-year-old, I didn't understand that. I would have walked right across the road and probably got hit by a car. But somebody helped me make those decisions early, and now they're easy to make as an adult. Other decisions we may think about and stress over those decisions for a day, a week, a month, maybe even a year. Think about when you were young, you were dating your spouse and your spouse goes, ah, I really want to get married. Um, <laughs> those are tough decisions sometimes. You may think about that decision for marriage over a year and finally you, you make that decision and hopefully it was a good one. So we make about 35,000 decisions a day. Now let's go back to all these subcontractors I've got here on the right-hand side of the screen. Every one of those people on that project site are making 35,000 decisions a day on that project with the potential of safety and risk involved in every one of those decisions. So that becomes critical on a project. Think about your own place of business in a manufacturing environment. You've got assembly lines, you've got manufacturing of things, you're making widgets, all these people making these decisions. Okay, just a little food for thought there for you. Cultural shapes, excuse me, cultural safety shifts. Has there been a shift in safety cultures in the last 80 years? Yeah, I think that's pretty obvious, right? Back in the 30s and 40s, uh, they were building high rises in the big cities. Um, the owners of those projects would actually calculate in one life lost for every floor of that building went up. And that was just, that was the safety culture of the day. It wasn't even given a second thought. Immigrant. Um, labor was cheap. It was, it was easy to find people to work. Um, that's kind of what built some of these buildings. But today, things look a little bit different, right? 
obviously our, our employees here on, on the left hand side, they're not up high, but if they were building a rebar cage at 20, 30 feet in the air, or even a higher, maybe a high rise rebar cage, when they go to pour that concrete, these guys working on these cages are gonna be tied off. But the personal protective equipment you, you see here in this picture, it's consistent from project to project to project. That is our safety culture. Um, misperceptions. You're gonna find people that say, I work in XYZ industry. Zero injuries, that's just, that's pie in the sky. It's, it's, it's not possible. Sooner or later, somebody's gonna get hurt and it, it may even be me. And I think, what a, what a terrible way to come to work. You know, thinking that today could be that day that I have that career ending injury. Your job as a safety professional should be to change that dialogue and mindset. Think about asking them a question. Did you get hurt yesterday? Chances are they're gonna say no. I have asked this question to one other person that did say yes, actually I did get hurt yesterday. And I asked them on a Monday, so it was on a Sunday that they got hurt at home. So typically that answer is gonna be no. And you're gonna ask them, why didn't you get hurt yesterday? Ask them if they got in a car accident yesterday. And if they say no, ask them why not? What did you do yesterday that you can do today and tomorrow and the next day that prevents you from being injured or getting in a car accident? And they're gonna say, well, you know, I did the speed limit or you know, I used my turn signals or I, I, you know, I kept that three second rule between um, my car and the car in front of me and there's things, things that we do. And I go, okay, can you do that again tomorrow? And can you do it the next day and the next day and continue doing those things to prevent injuries. And we go, eh, you know what, you, you've got a point there. Zero injuries is, is possible. I firmly believe that. I'm gonna share some numbers with you. These are actually our numbers from my organization. Um, I actually went to work uh, for Mark Young Construction back in, in 2016. And when I came to work here, and one of the first things I, I do is go back and look at the data. What's, what's the data saying that, that needs to be improved? And I looked at the OSHA logs and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> 27 through 2016, average number there is what, 10, 12 injuries? I mean, for a construction company our size, I'm looking at it and I go, not great. 2017, dropped it down to five. 2018, we bumped up a little bit to six. Um, get a little concerned, make some adjustments here and there. 2019, we've got it down to four. Year to date, this year, we're down to two. So when people tell me that zero is not possible, I'm gonna tell them we're gonna get there. So hopefully you can do the same thing on your projects. Let me ask you, should zero injuries be a goal? I think yes, other people may say, yeah, I think it's a goal, but the reality is maybe a little bit different. No, no. I like to say, yeah, because I, I like zero. What, if, if, zero is, if zero is not your accepted number, what's an acceptable number of injuries in your facility or on your project? Is one okay? Is two okay? Probably not if you're the one or two people that got injured. It's gotta be zero, guys. That's my firm belief. How do we get there? No, we could stop, we could stop reporting injuries, right? That's always an option. Um, how about incentives? What if my president came out tomorrow and said, I'm sick and tired of all these injuries. If we can go an entire year without an injury, I'm gonna give everybody a brand new Ford F-150 pickup. I can pretty much guarantee you we're gonna have zero injuries. Here's why, because Bill's gonna go out with a skill saw, cut his finger off, it's gonna fall on the ground, he's gonna reach down, pick it up, duct tape that thing back on and tuck it under his, under his arm and say, nothing happened here. If we're depending on stopping reporting and not communicating across the organization, this is the opposite, direct opposite of where we wanna go with injury reporting. We've gotta be honest and upfront with ourselves. If we don't know anything's going on in the field, then we cannot fix those things. 
and fixing is the only way we're gonna to get to zero. We learn from our mistakes, right? If nothing's ever reported, we're putting our heads in the sand. Encourage near misses, encourage minor injury reporting, encourage major injury reporting. We've got to know what's going on in the field. Perform those items that prevent injuries. And we'll talk more about that in just a couple minutes. Open communication. Supervisors, you've got to talk to your employees about safety. It doesn't have to be a constant communication. Bring one or two sentences into a normal conversation that mentions safety. Are OSHA regulations enough to prevent all injuries? No way. And I don't want an OSHA regulation for every potential situation on a job site or manufacturing facility or retail establishment, wherever you work. If you're running out of 1926 standards or 1910 standards, there can't possibly be enough regulations in there to prevent every injury. Here's an example why. I like to call it the 80-20 rule. And this has been true for every uh, employer that I've ever worked for. Uh, this is Mark Young Construction. So these are uh, four of the five reportable injuries that we had in 2017. So foreign object in the eye after removing a sweatshirt. Notice this is in March. In Colorado, March, it can be 25 degrees in the morning when we start work, and it can be 55 degrees by 9, 10, 11 o'clock in the day and warming up. So we had an employee um, that's working at a supermarket. He's up on a short scaffold. He's using a, a sawzall overhead and he's cutting away at some soffit to demo some soffit um, so we can do some modifications on the soffit underneath. As he's using that skill saw, he's got his safety glasses, you know, hard hat, he's got all his PPE on and he starts to warm up during the day. And so he stops what he's doing, takes off his hard hat, takes off his safety glasses and as he's pulling his sweatshirt over his head, he gets a piece of debris in his eye. Doesn't think much of it, kind of blinks a couple times, rubs it, tearing up a little bit, continues working throughout the day, continues rubbing that eye, and we all know what happens then. Um, ultimately, he ends up scratching the cornea of his eye because he didn't get it taken care of properly. Um, is there an OSHA regulation to prevent that Taking off the sweatshirt, probably not. Um, again, March 2017, we had an employee that was working in a, went into a connex uh, where we had probably 20, 30 boxes of uh, door frames and doors. He's looking for one particular door frame, goes into the connex, starts cutting box strapping and cutting boxes open to look inside, looking for that right box. As he's cutting the strapping, that strapping is dropping down to the floor. And employee turns around, trips over the strapping, falls on his elbow and ends up breaking his elbow. Um, one might argue with that, that there's a housekeeping standard in there and that it should have been cleaned up. But the reality is on a job site, is that employee supposed to cut that strapping, walk it outside, put it in a trash can and come back in cut another strap, walk it outside. Is he supposed to do that 15 times before he finally finds the right box? I would argue housekeeping on that one. Four wheel dolly flipped up, striking an employee's face. Like I said, we do a lot of uh, grocery remodels. And so uh, we had a cooler case that was being moved and uh, that cooler case was on a, a four wheel carts, a couple on each end. And we had another employee on a gin pole. And a gin pole is basically it's a big pry bar and you get underneath it and you lift that cooler case up. Well, as an employee was working with the gin pole lifting the cooler case up, one of the four wheel carts got a little cattywampus from where that cooler case was. And when the person on the gin pole set that cooler case back down, it hit the end of that, that four wheel dolly and it flipped up. Uh, hitting an employee in the face that had that was down on all fours, you know, looking underneath the, the cooler case. So, um, again, probably not an OSHA regulation there. But anyway, the four of these out of the five 
really had nothing to do with an OSHA regulation. These are actions and behaviors that were taken on by employees and decisions made, one of those 35,000 decisions, remember those decisions all have an element of safety and risk involved in them, behaviors and decisions made by employees that created the right elements for an injury to happen. So I don't think there are enough OSHA regulations in the book to prevent every injury. Um, and just like driving regulations out on the highway, we certainly don't want a regulation for every single thing. All right, I'm gonna shift gears here. I'm gonna talk about perception of risk. Um, understanding our own vulnerabilities and what could happen. I think everybody has a unique perception of risk. Some of us, um, well, let me start off by saying, I think a perception of risk is built into our DNA. It's built into us from our upbringing, who our parents were, who our siblings were, who our friends were, who our teachers were, the hobbies that we enjoy. And I think a perception of risk changes as we get older. I think the older we get, the less risk tolerant we are. So some of us are gonna be unicycle riders up on the high wire, 30 feet up in the air, right? Some of us like jumping out of a perfectly good airplane at 30,000 feet, maybe not 30, but whatever skydivers jump out at us. Um, some of us are two wheel bicycle riders. You know, we like two wheels under us. It's, it, it seems more steady. We, we get some training, we get some personal protective equipment and not in a, a bike helmet, maybe some gloves and, and knee pads. Um, the guy here doing the indoor skydiving, um, that's actually me doing indoor skydiving. I will not jump out of a perfectly good airplane. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but I, I, I've always heard about people talking about it. I wanted to experience it. So I did it within my own perception of risk. And I went down to a place called iFly down uh, in Lone Tree, south of Denver, and uh, did some indoor skydiving. Others of us, maybe we get a little bit older and we start thinking, I like four wheels under me all the time. I just don't bounce as high as what I was when I was 20 years old. It's just not gonna happen. So these are kind of our perceptions of risk and don't lose respect for the risk. I work in construction. It's pretty easy for me to ask people, hey, do you remember the very first time you pulled the trigger on a skill saw? And people go, mm, yeah, I kind of remember that. And I go, do you remember the power you felt in your hand when you pulled that trigger? And then you look down at that blade spinning a gazillion miles an hour, you have an instant respect for that tool, right? And then we use it for a week or we use it for a month and we get pretty comfortable with that level of risk. Don't lose respect for that because I will tell you whether you work in a manufacturing or retail or construction environment, every tool, every piece of equipment, every chemical has the potential to seriously hurt or kill somebody. So don't lose respect for those things. When you're thinking about your own perception of risk, think about what level of risk are you willing to accept for yourself? And what level of risk are you willing to accept for your employees? Think about those things. Don't forget, we make 35,000 decisions in a day. Every decision we make has an element of safety and risk involved in it. This is kind of my own definition of, a, of the life and death spectrum, right? Um, absolute safety. We're at home in bed, sound asleep, head in the pillow with not a care in the world. And the other end of the spectrum is I'm in a F-14 fighter jet or whatever. I'm in a fiery tailspin and my eject button is not working. Ultimate death, right? But the reality is we live somewhere in the middle. Think about your perception of risk and the potential for that perception of risk to be different across different units within your manufacturing organization, different job sites in your construction firm, or different stores within your retail establishments. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. And here's what it is. Subcultures. Beware of subcultures. Remember, we, I, I said everybody has a safety culture. Maybe good, maybe bad, but you have a culture. You have a safety culture. 
For me, Mark Young Construction, we have a safety culture that is somewhere between great and medium. We're moving that safety culture towards great. We're not certainly not there yet. But here's the potential, and it's based on perception of risk. For me, on construction sites, I have different leadership on every individual project. So right now, I've got 20, 22 jobs going. Every one of those jobs has a different superintendent that is leading that project. And if every superintendent has a different perception of risk, I have the potential to have a different safety culture on that project than a safety culture that has been established and is acceptable for market construction. Does that make sense? So I've got to ensure that my superintendents on those projects all have a clear understanding of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. What is risky and what, what is not risky. I've got subcontractors going from one market on construction project to another market on construction project. And if they're on one project and the superintendent says, boy, you better be wearing your hard hat and your safety vest and all your employees when they show up, they better have their right personal protective equipment and stuff in place. Okay. And then that subcontractor finishes that project, goes to another one of our project, and the superintendent goes, why are you wearing all this stuff? We don't need that today. No, don't worry about it. It's not important. That's a problem. So beware of subcultures. Open communication. Don't be afraid to speak up. Create within your safety culture a culture of open communication. And I'll give you an example. I used to work for um, a city organization. Uh, we had about 2,000 employees, about 35 different departments. Every department had a different and unique safety culture. It was, it was bizarre. Um, and trying to rein that in was next to impossible. But I'll tell you the safety culture within um, water production was like Vegas. Whatever happens in water production, it stays in water production, right? Everybody knows that department or that group where if something happens, nobody talks about it outside their organization. That's problematic. We've got to have open communication. So one day a guy from water production sent me a picture of um, one of his, his crews. They, had, they were down about 10 to 15 feet in an open trench. Um, they had a trench box in place, but they're putting in a new water line. They probably had 80 feet of the trench opened up. And it was a real wet spring, and about 40 feet of that trench just collapsed. <clears throat> All came in. Those three guys that were in the trench box, perfectly safe. Guy sends me a picture and said, hey, Lance, this is why we use trench boxes. Safety works, right? I'm like, yes, thank you. So... About two months later, I'm doing a trench and excavation class. We had four or five other departments in the city that, that all did underground utilities or, or different types of work that, that included underground construction. And so I'm doing a trench and excavation class and I put this slide up on the wall and everybody in that class looked at that picture and they go, oh my gosh, you know, we were 2000 employees, but those field guys, they all know each other you know, from one department to the next, and they go, wow, that's so-and-so, and that's so-and-so. I know those guys. And all of a sudden it clicks. This is why we use protection in trenches. So what good does it do? So I had two guys from uh, water production that were in that class. And after the class was over, they walk up to me and they go, hey, Lance, where'd you get that picture? <laughs> And I knew as soon as they asked me that, that question, I knew what was coming. And I go, ah, oh, so-and-so gave it to me. And he got nothing but grief for giving me that picture. But I ask you guys, what good does it do to keep that information within your department when there's so many other people in your organization that can use that information? Because sooner or later, they're gonna be in that same situation. They're gonna need that trench box. And that picture paints a thousand words, okay? We do the same thing at Mark Young Construction Project. Um, when something happens, we've initiated a process where um, I'll get notified, I'll do a minor investigation. If, there, if there's no injuries, we'll, we'll do some type of investigation. Collaborate that with that information, uh, consolidate it down to a couple paragraphs, 
And then we spread that information out to the rest of the job sites because sooner or later, every superintendent, every project engineer on that project, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be in that same situation. Use that information to everybody's benefit. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Incentives, um, we just encourage communication through incentive programs. The only incentives that we use here um, is identify a hazard, identify a near miss, report it, um, let me know what you did to correct that hazard or what you did to make sure that this thing doesn't happen again or how you want to get me involved. Have the project leadership sign off on it, get me the card. Um, I'll pick the best one out um, for the month and about once a month I'll give somebody a Carhartt jacket or a hundred dollar grocery gift card or something like that. Just something small that says, hey, thank you for being involved in your safety program. Thank you for being involved in the safety on the project. Thank you for looking out for yourself and others on that project. It says something to them. This is what we want our supervisors talking to our and if it's important to our supervisors, it's going to be important to their employees. So if our supervisors could care less about safety, safety is not going to be important to the employees. But if it's important to the supervisor and it's heartfelt and it's expressed on a regular basis, we don't need people to be safety geeks. That's my role, right? I'll be the safety geek. I'll be the dork on the project. But once in a while, bring safety into conversation. Talk to, your, talk to your employees. Hey, do you have the equipment that you need? If not, how can I help you? Employees will usually rise to the level of performance that you expect from them. That's kind of commonplace in our organization. Yeah, once in a while we get some people that, you know, they just don't care and, you know, unfortunately they're not working for us anymore. Challenge employees to report hazards and misses. Don't penalize them for it, okay? Don't make them a scapegoat. If they report things to you, great. Take care of it. And if you don't take care of it, assign it to somebody else to take care of. But it has to be responded to. If somebody reports something, something has to happen. Because if nothing happens with it, people just quit reporting. And then what happens to your safety culture? It goes down, right? Regularly, regularly mention safety in your conversations. Like I said, it doesn't have to be consistent. It doesn't have to be all the time. But just bring it into casual conversations. Explain the why, okay? If you tell somebody to tie off at six feet, don't just tell them they have to tie off at six feet. Explain to them why. What is the reason for doing that? All right, measure and performance. Um, a couple ways of doing this. Leading and lagging indicators. Lagging indicators are those things that... Um, are those things that you measure that have already happened in the past. Um, they include things like your experience modification rate, your total case incident rate, days away or transferred rate, uh, lost time incident rate. These are all data points that measure failures. They are things that have happened in the past, not a darn thing you can do to prevent that person from being injured now. It's, it's done, it's over with, we can learn from it, but there's nothing you can do to prevent from happening or prevent that person from being injured because it's already happened, right? There's very little value in those numbers to me. Um, the people that want those numbers are OSHA, your insurance company, maybe your brokerage company. Um, if you work for a construction company, your, your ownership wants those numbers because they want to look at you as a general contractor. They want to see what your numbers are as a basis for what your safety program looks like. Um, does experience modification rate exactly identify what you're doing with safety in your projects? I think it has very little to do with safety on projects, to be honest. I mean, that's, 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 those are data points that happened three years ago. It's not today, it's not current, it's not accurate. On the flip side, We've got leading indicators. Leading indicators are those things that we do to prevent injuries. There are things like how many toolbox talks, how many trainings did we get done last week? How many employees did we touch with safety training last week? Completed weekly safety inspections. We require weekly safety inspections on all of our projects, not just from me, but from the leadership on that project. 
Um, how many subcontractor safety orientations did we complete last week? How many hazards were identified in the audits? How many of those hazards were corrected? How long did it take to correct those hazards? Um, how many hot work permits did we complete where we needed them? So when I'm auditing a job site, I'm looking at, I'm going over to an area and I'm looking, well, it looks like the plumbers were here and they did some sweat fittings. Obviously they used a torch to do this. I should find a hot work permit somewhere in the stack of, of paperwork that I'm looking at. Lockout tag got completed correctly. Um, subcontractor safety data sheets are in place on every project. These are things that we use as key performance indicators or KPIs um, as an organization. Maybe you have your own, maybe you're looking for your own, developing your own. But let me tell you about key performance indicators on the leading side. They will have a direct relationship on your lagging indicators. If you're doing a great job on your KPIs and they're affecting your lagging indicators, that's, that's where your goals need to be, okay? Let me ask you a question. Why do we need safety professionals? Um, is it a virtuous thing? Is, 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 should every employer be required to have a safety professional? I'm gonna go back to that concept of safety is number one. As far as I'm concerned, number one priority for my business is keeping the front doors open. It's building buildings, it's, it's remodeling buildings, and we're integrating safety into that process. We are a safe general contractor. We're not a safety company. We're a general contractor, we build buildings. Your safety department or your safety professional or your safety person or your officer or whatever that title might be, it may be four or five people within your organization. They need to be viewed as a profit center. I'll give you an example. You saw the numbers, 27 through 2015, um, or whatever that, those dates were. Those numbers were not great. There were projects we could not bid because we didn't have the numbers to, to even get in the door to some of the, to some of the owners that wanted Mark Young Construction to do the work, but they wouldn't allow us because of our safety records. So lowering our injury numbers, lowering those lagging, lagging indicators allowed us in the door. Today, we're doing millions and millions of dollars in, in, in projects, in contracted projects, because our numbers are lower. My department is viewed as a profit center for this organization. And it shouldn't be any different from anybody else's organization. Safety should not be a cost center, it should be a profit center. But it all depends on how you communicate what it is you're doing in the organization, how you're communicating to your upper management on those data and statistics that they wanna know about and what value you bring to the organization. It's keeping, safety should be keeping your front doors open. Safety should be building your business and making it a larger, more profitable business. How is safety viewed by your organization, by upper management? How is it viewed by your line managers? How is, it, how is safety viewed by your field, your field leadership or your frontline workers? And keep in mind that, that safety, you are not safety. So when I ask these questions, how is safety viewed? I'm not asking them what their view of me is. I'm asking them their view of, Hey, what's our safety program doing? What's our safety culture like in this organization? How is it affecting you directly? How is it affecting how you do your work? Those things need to be kept in mind when you're, when you're building your safety program. And the answer to these three questions should be pretty consistent throughout your organization at all those different levels. But ultimately, do you bring value to the organization as a whole? Your organization is Unless your organization is a nonprofit or you're a safety company, you should be a profit center. Communication, we kind of talked about this. Um, I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time on it, but when you're talking with your upper management, VP, CEO, president, whoever that may be, talking communication styles and, and terminology that they understand. Um, 
for you to go out and, and tell the president you walked around the corner of a scaffold and almost got hit by a brick, maybe not good. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, if you're talking data and statistics and how you're building the organization, how you're promoting your department or the work that you're doing as a profit center for the organization, those are things that are key that those guys want to hear. Middle management, line workers, develop relationships and relationships are key. I can't stress enough how badly we need to develop relationships as safety professionals with everybody that we're communicating with. Relationships don't mean you have to be their best friend, but you need to have a relationship with everybody that you work with. I'll tell you the first, probably at least the first month, month and a half, I was at Mark Young Construction. I did nothing but build relationships. And I'm sure people were looking at me going, what is this guy doing? Is he ever gonna do any safety work? But ultimately those relationships is what allowed me to come into the organization and make changes. And changes don't happen without relationships, without trust and rapport and, and people knowing you as a person. Earn the trust, earn the respect, communicate in story form. Um, I threw this slide in only because it has a little bit of relational value here, but does it matter where safety resides in your organization? I, I really don't think it does. As long as you have good relationships built within your peers and your, in your team and within your organization that allows you to be able to communicate from the top to the bottom. Um, when I worked for the city uh, that I was telling you about earlier, the city manager came to me and he said, hey Lance, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the number of injuries that we're having within the city and, and different departments. And we had a really good conversation. He goes, I want you to put together for me just a couple paragraphs of what you think we need to do. And so I went back and um, was talking to my boss about it and my boss really got up, up, uptight. <laughs> because there was this line of authority that you are not to cross. So according to him, I should not have been talking to the, CE, to, the, to the city manager. Everything that I did should have been through him and through his boss and ultimately up to the city manager. So putting together this one to two paragraph um, structure of what I thought we needed to do within the city to increase our safety culture and reduce the number of injuries ultimately took three months and six pages of documents before it finally made it. Actually, I take that back. I don't think it ever made it to the city manager. So what did that do to the relationship between the city manager and myself? I, I don't know, but I was stuck in the middle. So I'm gonna say, does safety matter, matter where, does it matter where safety resides? Probably not, but you got to have that open communication. So whether you report directly to the president, the vice president, or a structure below the vice president, maybe that's the HR manager, production manager, uh, purchasing director, whatever that situation is, you've got to be able to talk freely between whoever your leadership is and where you are in your line level employees. Um, there, you know, it goes vice versa as well. So if you need to communicate with line level workers, it shouldn't have to go through your middle management down to your supervisors or whoever that may be in order to get to the employees. Safety needs clear lines of communication. When I was young and dumb, um, I think one of my first jobs, my title was safety compliance or safety compliance officer. And I had all this responsibility and no authority. And I would go out and, and, you know, I would take my book and, you know, I'd go up to somebody and go, hey, in our policies and procedures here, it says you have to do this. So I expect you to do it. How far do you think that went? <laughs> Not very far. Um, all the responsibility with no authority makes for a very unsatisfying job until you change the way 
you view your level of responsibility and authority and what that looks like. Um, relationships. I said relation, there's nothing more important to a safety person than a relationship with everybody in that organization. You don't have to be friends, but you need to have a working relationship. Be a part of the solution. What if you're not relational? That's fine. You can still be an effective safety person. Um, some people are very introverted. Some people are, are extroverts and they get along great. They build relationships really quick. Um, others don't. It, it really doesn't matter. You just need to be able to build relationships. How can you go about doing that? Think about these bullet points. Do for one when you can't do for all. Even if it's just one person that you're helping do something, great. If you can do something for everybody, that's even better. But do for one when you can't do for all. Remember people's names. I will be the first to admit I'm, I'm terrible at names. Um, sometimes I, I will be introduced to somebody. I'll shake their hand pre-COVID. I'll shake their hand and five minutes later, I, for the life of me, I cannot remember that person's name. We've all been in that situation. But find a way, whether it's a tool or a game or if you have to write it down, remember that person's name because when you re remember that person's name, it, it builds that relationship. It makes it personal. Drive by complimenting. Even if you're, you're in a hurry to get somewhere and you're walking by somebody and you see them doing something right, mention it. Hey, Bill, good job on, on XYZ, whatever it is you're doing. Catch people doing things right. Public praise. Um, some people don't like public praise, kind of play that back and forth with, with different people as you're building relationships. You get to know people, think about how they like to be praised, but eventually get around to everybody and find something that, that they're doing right and mention it. Small gifts, big gifts, whatever it is, little gifts. Um, it can be a little squeeze toy up to a new car if you want. I don't, you know, whatever. A uh, new car may be a bit of a stretch, but think about gifts. Say thank you. A simple thank you goes a long, long ways. A thank you with their name attached to it goes even further. Walk among the troops. Get out and, and when I'm out on a job site and I see a concrete crew working over here, I, I go and I talk with them. If they're breaking for lunch, sit down with them and just talk about whatever. It doesn't have to be about safety. It can be about, it can be about sports, how, how terribly the Broncos are doing this year, whatever the case may be. When and where appropriate, jump in and help. If you have the opportunity to stop what you're doing and go help somebody do their job, not critiquing their job, help them do their job. Even if it's for five to 15 minutes, that goes a long way in building a relationship. In coming back and wrapping up um, this presentation, what does a strong safety culture look like? Safety is a business priority. I personally don't believe in safety first, but it is definitely a business priority that is integrated into everything that we do, whether that's estimating, um, whether it's, it's subcontractor communications, it's, it's everything that we do, safety is built into it, it's integrated. Our risk perceptions are not all over the board. They're consistent across the organization. Individuals can have their individual risk perceptions. They can be high wire unicycle riders or they can be four wheel bicycle riders. But ultimately when they are at work, our risk perceptions are consistent across the organization. Our perceptions of safety policies and procedures are consistent and respected. If our policies and procedures say we have a trench box in the trench at five feet, then that trench box is in every trench at five feet and deeper. Competency. Our employees get the training that they need to do their job effectively and safely. Employee, employer, open communications. Okay, we don't hold things within our little group. We talk openly about safety. It's communicating from the president down to that line level employee of what's going on in the organization as far as safety goes. And if an employee has a concern, 
every employee on this in this organization has the authority to stop what they're doing stop that work that they're doing and say there's got to be a better way of doing this and we will not move forward until we've got it corrected and people feel comfortable doing the work that we're asking them to do employees are involved in their safety they get involved in that incentive program they're identifying hazards and correcting hazards individual ownership of safety again people are involved our employees know that they are ultimately responsible for what they are doing. So key points here. Hopefully you've, you've, you've gathered up a couple acorns from this presentation um, and it's been at least enjoyable to you. Hopefully it's been eye-opening in a couple points, um, but if there's something you can use in this organization, please feel free to contact me. But culture, when you're changing, you're working on your safety culture, you're also affecting your organizational culture. Our perceptions of risk, relationships drive culture, communications drive culture, leading KPIs affect lagging KPIs. Culture drives compliance and KPI accountability. The stronger your safety culture is, the less likely you're, run, you're likely to run into problems with trying to enforce compliance with certain components of your safety policies and procedures. We've all run into this, right? And the greater, the, the better our safety culture is, the less problems we have with compliance. Safety is integrated, it's practical to the work that we do, and it's humanistic and it's relatable to all levels of the organization. And don't forget your safety department, your safety person, your safety professional is a profit center bring value to your organization. Your organization didn't hire you because they have to. Maybe there's some stuff involved with they get a break in their insurance or whatever because they hire somebody that's responsible for safety, but ultimately they hired you to make a difference in your organization. Be the difference, build your culture and make it a profit center. Okay, so that is my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. My contact information is below. If you have any comments, um, questions, concerns, um, please feel free to contact me at your convenience. I'd be glad to speak with you. And I believe um, Dave or uh, Stephanie or somebody is going to open this up to a little bit of question and answer. That's right. Thank you, Lance. That was just a great presentation. And also, thank you for illustrating what the safety culture at one of America's safest companies does look like. That was, that was great. Uh, and to our audience, as Lance just mentioned, we encourage you now to interact with Lance and with each other in the Q&A chat, which you'll see to your right. Uh, once again, thanks, Lance, and take care.